Michael Tassarian and I have been trying to connect for a couple of years now, and I was thrilled that our meeting finally took place. Having followed his work on Architects of Control in my radio show, we decided to spend our time together to talk about his newest books, The Irish Origins of Civilization. Michael contends that history, as it's been told, has omitted a significant series of proofs that not only did the highly advanced Egyptian civilization move to the West, to Britain, but prior to that, the ancient Druids moved to Egypt, taking their language, arts, philosophy, and wisdom with them. Their disappearance has caused cataclysmic events to occur on this planet, according to Michael. Everywhere we look, we're seeing structures beginning to crack, even crumble. And I think it's becoming obvious that there are, as the title of your film says, there are architects in control of all of this that's going on. What are you seeing as the dominant effects of the controllers right now? Well, there's many threads. There's a first thing to realize is that the architecture of control is very ancient. That never changes, even though it progresses. You know, people can say if they want from the historical ages, or if they prefer, like I do, to say it's even more ancient than that. The second thing is that the architects of control change, because of course some come, they die, and then the new generation springs up. You know, so this thing is uh, ever increasing as new people are recruited into it. They have a, the architects of control have a recruitment situation. They have a bloodline we've spoken about before. Mm -hmm. And also, it's not just that they may be biologically descended from a strict bloodline. Mm -hmm. I believe that does exist, and I've written on it. But there's also the, the uh, situation, the question of ideological mm -hmm. identification, which comes from the training, you know, the, the influence of these people's parents. Right. You know, and, and the rest of the kinds of rituals that mm -hmm. these people are subjected to and so forth and so on. So people can focus on that, which then brings you to individual members. The Winston Churchills, the Margaret Thatchers, you know, the Cecil Rhodeses, you know. Then you're into sort of these individuals and who conceived what and when. And some people may point to philosophers. You know, people have pointed to Aristotle, Plato, Nietzsche, you know, whether you agree with that or not. Who, who were the people who conceived this conceptually? Yes. You know, and we may agree or disagree on those. Then we have the executors, you know, who are much lower level uh, when it comes to the pyramid. So we can always focus on but those things. But they're the things. ones we tend to interface with and feel the presence of more. Yeah. So in fact, it's good though because then when you do expose some shenanigans from an Alfred Milner, right, or Colonel Mandel House or a Cecil Rhodes, people are more likely to believe you because there it is in black and white. Right. And a sane person can say, well, no, but dodgy there, yeah, and there seems to be these underworld connections. But the rest of it is really faceless, nameless. These and are people more that hard blend so far back that we can't ever see them. There's so many That's layers right. back, right? Right, and also more difficult to prove. As you step away from dealing with the architects and start dealing with architecture, you're a little bit more into the abstract. You're a little bit more into areas that it's harder to prove for people because at that point you have to have a certain kind of mind as well. You have to have a very synergistic mind. You have to have a very conceptual mind. You have to be, to put it in layman's terms, standing not too close to the great canvas of life and not too far away. Yes. What we're finding in these, uh, well, you find this in every modality of thought, but you certainly find it again in the, in the so-called alternative movement, is that either people have got their face stuck up to the canvas and going, this is it, it's this color, okay, it's They're this. They're too close. Right, it's, yeah. the, it's, it's them, <laughs> it's the Illuminati, it's the Jesuits, it's whatever. And they're right. They can be right, but they're only looking at one little brush mark or two little brush marks, right? Very good and then you've got the other kind who's standing too far away. And then they don't know the specifics. They go, yeah, I know there's a hidden government. Uh, yeah, I get it. You know, so what? Change the channel. You know, I'm going to go and watch some football now, right? So you have to be standing sort of a certain, and a good artist does this anyway. The man who's painting the picture had to do it. Why don't you? Right. You, you paint know? a stroke or two, you back mm -hmm. up. Oh, they, they know that Leonardo da Vinci visited his own paintings for sometimes 14 hours a day just to sit and look at it, mm -hmm. to, you know, stand close, to go far away. This is what an art artist does, this is what an art critic does. It's no different in, um, in life. So when you find, and it takes time, this could take years just to get to the perspective I'm talking about, can take years for people to just get that. Because, you know, and it happened for me too, that sometimes I was too close to the canvas and you're like, you know, you got this bugbear about one thing and you think you found it. And uh, you become sort of a little bit obsessed by that or whatever. Then you pull, there can be a swing where you pull too far back and then you kind of lose the detail, but 
there's an upside of that is as you start to see the, the globalness of this kind of thing, you know, and you get familiar with the hues and the textures. But as I say, coming back to your point, when you start dealing with the architecture, you need a synergistic mind, and there's not too many teachers who can do that. There's not too many people who can do that. So my slant now, after all these years, has become more to, yeah, keep on dealing with the, with the sort of practical examples, but other people have done that wonderfully. This mm -hmm. is fantastically canvas, my God. You know, I mean, from the time of uh, the earliest writers on conspiracy, G. Edward Griffin, Eustace mm -hmm. Mullins, you know, um, Gary Allen, you name it, there's a whole list of these people, and I hope the viewers are familiar with these people, and mm -hmm. including David Icke and others who are doing wonderful work on this. This is beautifully done. There's been case histories, there's profiles, these people have been exposed thoroughly. Yes. We're talking even about the Queen of England and all her coterie and all of these, you know, monstrosities. At the same time, then it's good to sometimes say, yeah, but this is very ancient, to show the whole architecture of it. So in the recent work, the Irish Origins of Civilization uh, specifically, and I hope we can get into that more because I want to actually make sure that people understand why I'm even using the word Irish for a start. Most people have right. said, what? Yeah. Just hearing that, it's what? Not a Irish exactly. Origins yeah. of Civilization? The very word has to be defined because it's not a travel guide, heritage, Irish history context. The word Irish is a very specific word that most Irish people don't even know what it means. But getting out of that, the idea is that the Irish book was done again to take this thing back, to show the ideological connections, and to start showing how this thing began. What's it all about? You know, um, how does some? Because if you're seeing something today—a tyranny, a pestilence, some sort of pathogenic thing, a, a mental epidemic, or whatever that's infecting people and making them sociopathic and fragmented. My God, if that, if that steamroller, if that caboose is still moving, it must have had one hell of an engine or an impulse to move it in the first place. Exactly. And Jordan, Maxwell, and I, we've always addressed this thing about what is at the top of the pyramid. You can't understand the bottom unless you understand the top. Who is operating from the top part? And so the top part also has four sides. So even that's not, it's not too easy to discover even then, because even one perspective is not good enough. You've got to do some circumambulating here, and you'll get things wrong. Yeah. You're going to get things wrong. Because the sun, you know, the light may not be right today. Your own emotions may color the thing. Uh, listening to a bunch of other voices yeah. may interfere. Um, not the best way you see is, and remember, not everyone has the same approach. It's, mm -hmm. There's a different understanding of this. Just like in the same way, uh, you can use the same words mm -hmm. and mean different things. So the incredible thing is that never to lose sight of the fact that how ancient is this thing and what kind of impulse started it. And then we're into the world of the solar cult. Then we're back into the world of astrology and astro astrotheology. We're going back to the roots of Christianity and Judeo-Christianity, whether the people who are into those religions accept us or not. It's a bona fide fact that the stars, the heavens, was the original temple of God. It's referenced in the Bible multiple places in mm -hmm. code. The Bible is absolutely loaded with Druidic symbolism. And then again, to even use the word druidic, we need to have that defined. Is it the same as has we're been going presented? To define that. Yeah, has we're, it been? Is it, it the same as what has been presented yeah. before? You know, um, what does the word really mean? Was it used in other countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So just in the mere definition of names, and this for me started way back in 1980. That's how I got interested in it. The mere looking at the deconstruction of these terms that have been handed to us in the media and the mainstream was of great fascination to me personally. I didn't have you, a big you're picture. You're an etymologist, really. I mean, well, this is... I f yeah, I study the etymologists and yeah. philologists, you know. I'm not, uh, you know, in any sense an academic, you know, mm -hmm. expert or anything like that. But I don't think you have to be. No, you've laid down some yeah. really fine findings right. here. And I think what, these are all eclectic. Yeah. Just like language itself is eclectic. Yeah, uh, so is the study of language. And also I'm very against academic, uh, you know, all knowledge is free for all people. It cannot be owned or territorialized as the orthodox, you know, university systems and want to do. And the basic fact in my life, uh, you know, an academic is basically somebody who's got like a, you know, a university degree on the front of their chest, but a target on the back. Mm -hmm. And they're, they, they, they're compromised individuals. So we have to question how really objective their work is. That's not to say that the Professor Thompsons, you see, and others from within haven't done wonderful work, but then they lose their jobs. They're demoted. Right. Even people at the top of the totem pole. You know, I could list many, many great scholars, and still today who are writing wonderful books on the origins of Judaism, and the origins of all of this kind of thing, who are delving into this, but they, are, they, they risk, you see, and they're going to be a minority right across the board. You know, I mean, people screamed about, you know, the Egyptians never used the ships until they dig one up about five feet from the pyramid. People said there was no such thing as the Gnostics until they dig, you know, their scrolls up from the deserts. You know, endless uh, anecdotes like this, you see. So we're in the age now of this uh, revision of history. And that includes the revision of words, the revision of language, the revision of terms, the revision of symbolism. 
uh, and almost everything we've been taught right across the board. We're not looking for experts, we're not looking for authorities, we're looking for people who've got that eclectic, synthetic, omnidirectional mind, you see, that can start to be okay with the deconstructive model. Don't worry about what's going to come out of it. Let the old system, you know, take it apart. This is what the uranium energy is also about, is sort of fragmenting everything to take it apart, to examine what it is. Open the shell, let's see what is this made of really, what's its components. And if we don't need it anymore, throw it out. Of course, that threatens a lot of people. Yeah. But to finish up, uh, you know, on the first point, that basically, then you're into the solar cult, you're, you're going back to the fundamentals of religion, you're going back to the fundamentals of communication, cosmology, thinking, thought, the zodiac and the inner zodiac. You're going back to the reasons why man thought it was important to erect pillars, obelisks, why they made the megaliths. Their relationship with the, you know, the, the, the cosmos was a relationship with the mother, you know, the divine mother, the presence that they never lost contact with, uh, with nature, which is the ultimate guide, which is the ultimate uh, teacher and tutor, you see. So you're going back to all of that, which today is looked at as a sort of a primitivism. Paganism. A paganism, you know. Not understanding, as I said, the Bible's full of it. You, you know, I can take you through chapter and verse to show the Druidic leitmotifs in there. The average Christian doesn't know it. Well, because the average Christian hasn't studied Druidism. My work will introduce them to that. Then they can see it for themselves. I'm not making a story up here. The harp, the tree, the oak, the fig leaf, you know, the, the men in white robes. Mm -hmm. uh, meeting Jehovah at the burning bush, etc., 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 are actually from a particular canon. They're actually from a particular archive, not the Judaic archive as we know it, and not the Christian archive as we know it. So, and this is, it opens up a whole, you know, fascinating well, study. Well, let's just jump into that can of worms because <clears throat> it's often thought, well, um, we go beyond the Christian era. We go back into the Egyptian mm -hmm. eras and some of the more ancient Egyptian civilizations, even into Sumerian, Babylonian, and so forth. And so it's been thought up to this point that there was a migration, right, from the east or right. southeast mm -hmm. to the northwest, right. to Ireland, and that mm -hmm. Ireland, a lot of what Ireland's more advanced civilization from ancient times displays really came from somewhere else. But you're saying it's exactly the opposite. Both. Both. Ultimately, it's the opposite, but let's just take it in steps. Yes, there was east to west migrations, but they were later. Yes, and well, let's get into that. Yeah. That's a very important distinction that is no. not being made no. anywhere. Well, this antediluvian. Yeah, and, and let's just look at not my work, but other works. The Graham Hancocks, the Michael Cremos, uh, and before them, you know, you even have the, the Eric von der Nikens. The cat is out of the bag, proving that obviously our history does not open 7,000 years ago or even 11,000 years ago. In Christianity, they said that the entire creation was 4,000 years old. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That kind of bogus nonsense is in the science world telling you that it all, our history traditionally opened because some baskets were found or the first numerical system has been completely demolished, yeah. you know, by people who are even go and taking photographs of it underwater and whatnot that show you that this is nonsense. Of course, any sane such man knew Such as Graham Hancock. Such as Graham Hancock. Mm -hmm. And therefore, but any sane man, even before their work, would have known this, and many have. Okay, let's go from there. The reason why they wanted an ice age inserted between you know, the Holocene and the Pleistocene, or the Pleistocene epoch, if you really want to be technical about it, they insert this thing with its ice ages between the post and pre-Diluvian. Why they wanted to make sure that history began at uh, seven to 11,000 years ago is for a very good reason, it's propaganda, is to make sure that nobody who's born later today or in the modern age will look back if you put this ice sheet there, if you put this naked world there, if you put this world in, ca in cataclysm there, no history. Woolly mammoths and all that, no history. No reason to look back. No. It's exactly the same, and I mean exactly the same, as when the Vatican said, well, you can't be sh sailing ships to the west of, of the world because you're going to fall off the edge. There was no difference in that. Scared a lot of right? young kids with an exploring yeah. spirit. At that point, they would have said anything. Yeah. And they did. The, the Western Isles were always considered the ghoulish, otherworldly, misty isles, and people believed this right up to the time of Galileo and even beyond. I think I actually have bumped into people who still believe it today. Right? So the thing is that that worked to stop people physically going there because they knew men of finances, men of money might independently get ships and go and find out what the real story is. So the Vatican made an all-out prohibition on that by saying that the world was flat. The thinkers did it historically by saying, well, it's flat. There's no history before X. And anyway, half the world, three quarters of the world is a bunch of pygmies and primitives, so we don't even need to worry about them. They're going to be conquered and colonized and they don't have a history. Right. And if they do, we'll wipe it off, so same result. Western man, European man, he's got the history, he's, he's, he's the big kahuna, right? So all of these mechanisms, plus the more subtle diachronic and synchronic manipulation of time and history, 
the Hegelian you know, dialectical pattern, if you want to get into that. There's all these various forms that these agents of the aristocracy, the oligarchy have used to prevent men looking back to these, the, in other words, the true history. What were they afraid of? What were they going to find? Well, let's go straight on then to the next step. This idea that I've worked with a lot, which is the opposite, as you're talking about, the movement of the elements of civilization from the western, northwestern hemisphere uh, to, the, to, to the east. I'm not the first. This was um, first, uh, it was a woman by the name of Anna Wilkes in 1889 who wrote a book, you know, on this, then followed up by the great Connor McDarry and then Cummins Beaumont in the 1960s. And you have a lot of references in your book. Yeah, their basically, work as well. my yeah. work, as I consider it, little more than an homage to them. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, somebody might say, you know, these are your own ideas, and I guess there are my own ideas there. Ultimately, the books were written. In fact, my happiest experience was writing the chapter on Cummins Beaumont. Uh, it felt like to me it was a great, um, I actually really don't even want to get into it, it's a very personal thing. Uh, to, to even be able to do that chapter on that man mm -hmm. it was like the, the, like the period at the end of the sentence for me, mm -hmm. you know, that's all I can say. But yeah, to do homage to the other ones as well was really great. And to my own ancestors ultimately, you know, the book is dedicated to the spirit of the ancestors, you know, in, in my own land, a sort of an homage that I lived in that land, I was born there, you know, so it's my way of giving something back. Mm -hmm. It is polemical. It is rebellious. It's yes. meant to be. Yes. You know, one of my but Irish. That's the uh, nature of the Irish people. Isn't yeah, that well, part um, of the spirit? Absolutely. Yeah. You know. And one of my Irish, uh, you know, mentors, Patrick McGowan, you know, when he was asked about the making of the prisoner, he goes, I wanted fists up on my face. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's, you know, well, you put, put the way I look at it. Well, you put fists up here on this one. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you're talking, mm -hmm. you, you, okay, uh, just continue what you're saying because we can jump into this story at so many points. Well, just briefly it. then, the idea that just to take on board the fact that what is so difficult to go out your garden gate and make a right? If you can make a right, you can make a left. So what is the big problem, the big obstacle with realizing that it might have been the other way? And remember, we're not talking about racial movement. People will hit me and go, what, what about the races and all? Where, I, where, where, where did you ever get that? I never talked anything about race. I talk about the elements of civilization which are completely separate from the question of race. This is not a racial matter, a racial superiority. And when we get into the, the analysis of the word Aryan, yes. we must hit on this yeah, that because that's a list, huge, yeah. you know, yes. been, and again, we'll find out why that's been so misappropriated. Mm -hmm. um, so the elements of civilization is basket weaving, mathematical concepts, music, you know, uh, design, hair braiding. They found them in the Tarim basins. The only place you find those braids is in Denmark. Explain it if you can, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the coloring of the hair, the using of the lime, the tartan, the horses, the burials, the positioning, the mound features. Mm -hmm. It's Western. You can either accept it or you can't. We're not trying to ram it down anybody's throats. It's a fact, mm -hmm. and the anthropologists know it. But upstairs says, don't publish it. You're not going to talk about it. Come up with some other bogus explanation, so etc. Well, because remember, you're dealing with. Well, let's cut to the chase with that then. Anyone watching this who is absolutely convinced that there is a world architecture of control, right, and is lamenting it and looking to understand why it arose, must understand this next point very, very, they must listen with all their mind to this next point. None of that architecture of tyranny, none of the genocidal psychopathy or any of that poison that the Black Lodge has created down through the centuries could exist. None of it. If the original people that I address, namely the Magi, the Elders, the Druids, existed. This brings up two points. One is that all these lodges, Masonic lodges, Rosicrucian lodges, and all the rest of it, all the elites today, everything they have is a cannibalization and a plagiarization of those elders. That's one, number one. And, and two, had those elders still been allowed to exist, the other could not exist. Yes. Because that school of light, that college of light, was vigilant. To this pestilence. They had rites, they had shamanic rites, they had the wicca, right? They had the, the whole shamanic um, matrix to make sure that a certain child ain't going anywhere if they're toxic, to the point that they'd even, as we know, leave them out to die. That's been overly exaggerated, of course, but the idea was, okay, if nature has created some rotten fruit, rotten fruit grows on a tree, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite natural to let that rotten fruit fall and die and perish mm -hmm. so it doesn't destroy the whole crop or whatever. And these druids, these elders, these matriarchs understood that this is also a law. There is a catabolic force that you must honor also. And therefore, by not letting the creme, by not letting the scum rise to the top as these fraternities now not only permit but promote, promote yeah. right? 
They did the opposite. The Druidic colleges did the opposite. They made sure that the scum stayed cleaning the floors and doing whatever they needed to do, and that the, only the pure rose to the top. So when these people bash Plato and bash the philosopher kings, you know, they're coming from a very, very limited state of understanding. The original principle of Plato and his philosopher kings was not totalitarian control, as Fabian left-wing people in the universities are trying to tell you that. Why don't we ask who's teaching Plato, you know, if we wanted to get into that? But the point is that none of these Platonic people were pushing any type of totalitarian New World Order. What they were showing you is that if the man who has his inner republic in harmony, he can rule. He will not be a tyrant because he doesn't understand, he's, not, he's not working with tyranny. In fact, his job is to filtrate tyranny. He's, he's the meter for your tyranny. The very people who are bashing this concept, what, you're supporting the world we have now then? <laughs> yeah. Could it be any Which worse? Which is the antithesis of that, that it's the inner antithesis republic. Of, right. Yes. So anyway, back to the main point. The thing is that, so the, the new order, the Black Lodge, that subsequently, in Ireland's history, it's about 500 BC that the problems began. That group that now builded, has built the universities, has created the literature, who funds the intellectuals and, and funds the histories, this whole organism, this whole pathogen could simply not exist if the other existed. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if it's the Indian Aryan version, the, the, the Chaldean version, the Sumerian version, you know, the uh, Scythian Celtic, mm -hmm. and then the Gaelic Irish. Wherever the mystery school teachers were, as long as they existed, there is no chance for this reprobate version to exist. That is why, the, that is the ultimate reason for the campaign of genocide. I dealt with a campaign of genocide in a slightly different context in the Atlantis book, mm -hmm. you know, which also dealt with the Irish thing. It's developed much more in the Irish Origins book. But there's a reason for it. And then secondly, you may destroy the root, but that doesn't mean that you haven't abused the fruit. Right. So just, uh, they all had their baskets ready for the, 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 the teachings, the principles, the astrology, the astrotheology, the astronomy. All of these principles uh, that was uh, garnered over thousands of centuries. Uh, in other words, the building of the stone megaliths, how they could align mm -hmm. that. You know, everyone knows, how did they do it? You know, wh where did the antecedent stages come for these mathematical concepts or these mm -hmm. great tools or the building of the pyramid? They're trying to tell you out of nowhere. This was the fact that our Earth civilizations existed longer. The proof is right there. I don't know why it's taken people so long to understand this. You know, even a school child can't just do calculus right away. There's a antecedent steps. Can it be any different with the civilization? So the idea is that um, there's been a wholesale genocide of those people. The people who studied the witch hunts of you know the Dark Ages understand exactly what I'm saying. I'm not saying anything different than what happened to the Huguenots, what happened to the Wicca, what's happened to you know uh, many races throughout even recent periods. Mm -hmm. Except what you know, my concentrating on ancient ancient history. And of equal or secondary importance is the fact of the cannibalization of their gnosis. And that's where the elements of our civilization now appear. The architectural motifs, the design of cities, but the symbolism, with, and all of the above. But with no carrying none of the wisdom or knowledge forth with it. No, it's a cannibalization of yes. that. And so this is then rebounds back to the question of those who are maybe getting into a little critiquing of this. They are critiquing, if you don't like a, a piano player's rendition of a piece of Chopin, don't blame Chopin. Mm -hmm. If you don't like what Edward Bernays did, don't blame Freud. If you don't like what Annie Besant did, don't blame Blavatsky. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it makes me cry that we have this kind of le low level of intelligence right, at this point because the, the research isn't there. What we have today is, is, is the cannibalization of all these ancient traditions don't blame the Druids. Don't blame the men who created that for the good of all humanity. Right? Blame those who cannibalized it. So a lot of these tropes were done for reasons. The Druids would do it for reasons. You know, why certain megaliths were put here, why certain you know, structures were put there. There was also a healing of the earth going on. It really helps to remember that the application is very important. There's two forms of application of this gnosis. There's the, the application of the purists who created it, and then there's the subversive or subverted, you know, use application of the later Black Lodge. And that's very powerful, to have something that can be misconstrued and then passed on as truth, when it has some essential beauty and truth in it, is easy to sell. But do you see that it's because it has beauty in it that it's yes. subconsciously attractive to most Absolute. people? Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. It's it's incredible. Because yeah. it has those constituents, people will buy it. Mm -hmm. So I can see the problem. If you have that amount of beauty and truth embedded in something that has been co-opted for perhaps even a reverse purpose, you mm -hmm. know, so a purpose antithetical to that, 
how are we to feel the difference when we're origin when we're we're essentially connecting with that original truth and beauty? Yeah. The, I mean, the possibility for disinformation, misinformation, mm -hmm. and misalignment mm -hmm. is unbelievable. How are we yeah. to know the truth anymore? Well, let's take the same point up to the metaphysical level. What is evil? Evil does not have anything of its own. It's negation. Evil only exists, or its modus operandi, is the violation of something that was originally good or positive or, or wholesome or holistic. If it can subvert, skew, change, morph, you know, uh, modify, or in some way contaminate or corrupt that which is positive, then you have a definition of evil. Mm -hmm. That's what, of its own, it has no power at all. Well, the, that, this connects a lot with the root of my optimism is because evil by its very definition is telling nature, come and get me. Anything that lives in violation of nature's ordinances is raising a red flag going, I shouldn't exist. And nature in its own sweet time will take care of it. So, uh, you know, like people who get really pessimistic and down about what's going on, my message to them is, don't you see that evil has within it the seed of its own destruction? Now, mm -hmm. people who've read the last chapter of my Atlantis book know that I've already gone into this, but it needs to be repeated time and time again. Repeat it. Evil is, contains within it the seed of its own annihilation. It is not something that is sustainable even though you know we may because it's against, going against all principles in nature of life right and nature is yeah. in perfect order perfect yeah. balance the Egyptians always showed that as the feather of the goddess Mayat and the yes. great scale of life right it's an incredible metaphor and other other uh, cultures have you know used various metaphors for this homeostasis or this balance or this equilibrium yeah. uh, this this order is inviolate in fact some of the shamanic groups talk about the fact that man's probing into the, you know the subatomic as his probing into the physical is his insecurity. He needs to control Mother Nature. He needs to op oppress it. He needs to organize it. You know, he needs to understand it, dissect it. You know, Leonard Schlein, who sadly passed away recently, wrote Alphabet Versus the Goddess and Art and Physics, these great books that meditate on these ideas about what is this phallic or ithyphallic, you know, need to dissect, you know, the old Newtonian paradigm. This is because man, this, this, this kind of thinking, this yang modality, this uh, acquisitive masculine mindset is insecure and it cannot turn itself on to understanding what that miracle of life is all about. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, just like people like Ken Wilber have examined and even you know uh, Michael Talbot in the holographic universe mm -hmm. paradigm, the psychopath cannot see holarchy, not even if you pointed it out to him. You'll mm -hmm. go, but it's hierarchy. No, it's holarchy. No, 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 it's hierarchy. Look, can't you see? Mm -hmm. So it's like some sort of twilight zone situation in which even if it's in front of them, they're not seeing what you're seeing. This, and in fact, I've even gone so far as to say it's a definition of psychopathy is hierarchy. So all the structures that the Brotherhood, the Dark Lodge, you know, create are hierarchical because they're based on psychopathy. Now, the Architects of Control, you know, DVD series that we're doing is an examination of what that is. Mm -hmm. It's not bashing technology. It's saying, hey, uh, you know, what is technology in the hands of a psychopath? Right. Remind, it reminds me of this old, uh, you know, um, Charles Bronson movie, Death Wish, you know, where he goes, I ain't got a problem with a guy, I haven't got a problem with guns. I got a problem with a lunatic with a gun. Right? <laughs> exactly. That worries me. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. Right? So the technology is helping us. It's great. Look at the wonderful things, you know, yeah. to be able to fly around the world and communicate and the cameras and all of this kind of thing. Nothing wrong with it. But that powerful, wonderful, you know, uh, creation in the hands of people who are demented in a Freudian way, in a Jungian way, whatever way you want to talk about it, who are really fragmented, you know, uh, and, uh, from a Christian point of view, you could say they're possessed. Mm -hmm. They're infected with something, a dark sorcery. Mm -hmm. You know, in my work, I talk about the difference between sorcery and magic. The magician is the one who can walk, walk through all the hell and walk through all the pain and the suffering and walk through the fire but still come out centered. The sorcerer is the one who takes the same journey but he gets seduced. And sadly, the two have been thrown together in the same pot. Again, we're back to this whole etymology thing. We're yes. back to this blame game. We're back to this, uh, you know, it's, it reminds me of the old uh, Alexander Pope, you know, uh, lines, drink it or touch it, not that Pyrenean spring, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. That might end up being one of the, the most profound, yes. you know, statements ever. Yes. There are actually some more profound, but that one is high up when you really start to contemplate it. Yes. So it seems to me it helps to jump back a bit because as I was reading Irish Origins, you're getting back to, again, these architects of control, and you are going back mm -hmm. into the Atlantean period of time, even the Lemurian period of time, and you're saying, from what I understand, tell me if this is what you're saying, that these advanced civilizations and the knowledge that they possessed, and that was seeded throughout the countries of the planet, I mean, we're talking even into the Americas and so forth, 
had its origins from the Atlantean period of time, right? But this is also where you're saying the corruption occurred, right? Yeah, absolutely. Can and you talk, talk, talk about that a little bit, that corruption, and how did this seeding happen into Ireland, into Egypt, into some of the Americas as well? There was very advanced knowledge in all these places, and as you show, common etymology the the word sources in gaelic and algonquin yeah, that's true. is it's amazing when i when i saw that chart that you yeah. put up yeah that research still goes on yeah you know in fact if people pick up because uh, you were talking about atlantis just go and pick it up here's a little pulp book i refer to it by charles burlitz the language expert this is from the burlitz family he's the guy who basically started the language books yeah. he was one of the leading authorities on atlantis and if you go and pick up his book called Atlantis, the Eighth Continent, he goes in even into equal depth into the etymology, showing the connections between not just America and Ireland, but all through the world, the same uh, cuneiform, the same uh, you know, phonograms and ideograms, right there. It's absolutely provable. You know, you take this all the way to the idea that they're trying to bury this knowledge now, like stones that the great megaliths are, are, you know, are habitually turned around so mm -hmm. that nobody can see the petroglyphs anymore. Yes because those will show not only that there's astrotheology involved, but there's even you know, incredible uh, druidic symbolism there, the runes. So these will be defaced. These will be you know, marred, because again, this knowledge, they don't want, there's people who don't want this to get out so they can see these hidden connections. So what is the Atlantean knowledge that was passed forward that's springing up now? I mean, there are a lot of fingers and a lot of dikes trying mm -hmm. to keep things quiet. Yeah, it's not working yeah. too well anymore. Well, the main thing that happened in Atlantis um, is that um, If you look, if you, the roots, the roots of all the um, idioms that you see today, do go back before the, you know, the official dates. Yes. So when we're talking about, the, we're really talking about what's called the pre-Diluvian or pre-flood era, right. and some people like to call it Atlantean Lemurian period, and it split hairs over that. The idea is that, as has been proven now by the artifacts and relics, there was civilizations that existed before ours. Obviously, they're not there anymore. So what happened to them? You know. Uh, this has become the great question. I connected, I, I turned to the legends of the world, especially the Irish legends, as, as another person would turn to you know, a, a fact book or an encyclopedia. In my, in my world, if it's in the myths and legends, it's good to go. Mm -hmm. you know, people may critique me for that and think that's crazy. As far as I'm concerned, and I'm very much coming from the Joseph Campbell school here, you know, and, and the Mercia Iliad and, and this kind of school, I'm pretty much it's good to go. Doesn't mean it's not colored and flowered up in poetry, right. poetized. Doesn't mean that it hasn't been misinterpreted or potentially can be misinterpreted. Especially Irish legends. My God, you've got to plow through a lot of fairy folk tale, you know, stuff yeah. there to get to the root of what's there. But when you do, same with the Arthurian tradition, you're and you've getting seen something the same very powerful. Stories pop up all over the planet. Right. This in, is in, this is in fundamental. The indigenous cultures. So I, I hope we can talk about that more. That's f totally fundamental. Yes. Okay. So then something happened back then. And the, in the ancient legends, they're talking about couple of concepts. One is the Great War of the Gods, which is one of those, you know, the seminist myths that's everywhere. The cosmologies, that something got created, got destroyed. Often, like in the Popol Vuh and in many of the Irish legends, uh, they're indicating that there's something either alien, physically, extraterrestrial, or spiritually off-world. Spiritually, you know, different. And it, it can be difficult to say which one it is, depending on what myths you're reading. Mm -hmm. But Zachariah Sitchin is pretty convinced that when he read the Sumerian, it's clearly extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. I tend to agree with that. Well, if you look at some of the pictographs and so forth, it would yeah. certainly indicate yeah. that. I think so. And same with Eric von der mm -hmm. You know, I think so. That, that there's a lot of stuff there you know, to, to look into, and it needs to be taken on board. Other people may go, no, no, I prefer it's something else. It's more spiritual. Either way. right? So the thing is that um, I look to those, and then I start to look at this concept. Then you have the Emanuel Velikovsky you know, connection who comes in and says, and that war of the gods or some was a metaphor for some cosmo cosmological thing that took place, like the interference of a comet, mm -hmm. uh, which he thought might have been part of Venus. Others think it's a, a, a cometary body called Phaeton, you see, that caused these calamities. My interest in all of this is not that. That's all very interesting. In fact, I would say that even my interest in ancient history is, 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 is secondary to the interest in what's going on today. I'm not a historian, actually. You know? And in one way, you know, even though I deal so much with ancient history, it's not really my concern. My concern is what's going on now, and particularly what's going on now in consciousness. What is man? What is, start here. Start with what you've got. 
How did the human creature become what he is today? So does that almost require a need to back engineer the story? Yes. That's the sum total of everything I do. That's my interest. How did the human mind or the ego come to into being? You know, nobody's really touched on that. Uh, the, the ones who have, again, steer away for whatever reason, you know, away from the path that I've chosen. So to continue the point is that I think that the, something happened to the ego of man, his consciousness, his psychology, that started about 10,000 years ago. And then I had to decide in my work whether it was just earth changes and cataclysms. Is that it? Is that, all there is that the reason? It's bad enough. You know, including cometary celestial mm -hmm. upheaval. Is that it? Like Velikovsky and people are saying. Was it, as the myths are indicating, some sort of um, spiritual war? See, I'm open to that. I can, I can imagine that that could have taken place, and I can, I can handle that. I think if it, if it did happen, was that it? You know? Was there a sorcery thing going on? Is there, is there some... Could it be multidimensional in nature? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or was it, as they say, you know, a, a visitation, a pure vis a trauma caused by a visitation? As I started looking at these matters more, I discovered that it's basically all of them. And then I try to put it in, you know, some sort of order in the Atlantis book to talk about the potential. Not that I'm right, again, you know, or anything like that. I'm just creating a story based on all these collated facts. I'm trying to summate. Mm -hmm. But what am I trying to summate? I'm trying to summate something that's vast mm -hmm. into 400 pages or a couple of chapters or whatever, you know what I mean? So it became, that's all a challenge as well. So the way I presented it was that there was this off-world presence that came here, and the trauma that we're still reeling from was... Uh, was, about two, was threefold. First, there was the violation of the planet by this off-world presence. Then there was the, the violation of man's biology through their genetic hybridization transgenic experiments. Third, there was the trauma that, we, that humankind suffered from the war that erupted between these same gods, so-called gods, the parties. So man's, man's psyche, as we know it, suffered basically three and even maybe four vi very, very severe traumas that shattered the ego in the same way that in William Blake's iconography, Albion, who is sort of a godlike figure, uh, Blake describes him falling from the heavenly world into the material world, and he splits into four parts. I've always found that very striking, and in a way, I can borrow that metaphor to talk about how man's ego, or man's consciousness, more correctly, shattered into four or five parts, mm -hmm. you see, like this. And we're still trying to glue them back together. But there, wasn't there also a forgetting process that occurred? Yeah, the There was vast knowledge from that trauma. Mm. I mean, it's really yeah. about yeah. forgetting. The amnesia. The amnesia. Yeah. The historical amnesia that so many people have addressed. It seems like that, that's yeah. the single largest factor facing mankind is it the is. amnesia. Yeah. We're just starting to awaken right. in what's happening. And just like it's, it's easy to take a very difficult thing and laugh at it and you'll accept it, man still wants to revisit that trauma, but he does it through the day after tomorrow, yes. blockbuster movie. Right? Exactly. Charlton Heston and the earthquake. Because there's you a know? remembrance and a resonance yeah. there. Right. Or, or, or even what was those preposterous films, uh, you know, a million years BC or whatever, you know, yeah. uh, whatever. The whole smorgasbord of those films, dealing with cataclysm and fighting monsters and chucking spears at dinosaurs and, yeah. you know, and volcanoes run, you know, what is all of that? And the day the earth stood. The still. day the earth stood still. All of the above. All of the above. If you decode it, if you have the what, we, what I call the symbolic literacy, there it is. You you have to break it down into an acceptable form that has a lot of little bells and whistles uh, along with it you know, entertainment factors, to process it. Highlander. Yes. I mean, the list is, let's not even get into it, because the list goes on and on and on of the movies that are pivotal, iconic, or what have you, that deal with this, you know. Uh, Matrix, uh, you know, you can update it and upgrade it in many different ways, but the principle remains the same, that man is revisiting this traumata, but he's doing it in a way that is a little bit more safe than handling it directly, you see, to deal with what his ancestors went through, because that's still too painful. It's still too recent. The wound is too important. Now, jump forward again. Like I said, my interest is now. If that trauma existed, could it be co-opted by the Black Lodge? If they know that man is already an anxious, ridden, fragmented, and traumatized individual, you think they're not going to make perfect use of that fact? Absolutely. That's, that's to a large degree what I feel right. has happened, right. is simply capitalized, seizing the opportunity. Yeah. They were, their ancestors are responsible for the trauma in the first place, 
and their descendants, again, yes. biological or ideological, right. are... are uh, and that's an important distinction to they're make. They're capitalizing that. on the mm -hmm. continued trauma. In fact, even when there's not enough trauma, they'll do some rug pulling themselves, as they're doing right now. Right. Oh, the economy, all oh, this and that. You don't know that this is by design yet? This is all for, this is all for the inducement of fear. Can you beat it into their heads? Yeah. This is uh, an multiple. The wall goes up, no, the wall is coming down. The war is starting, no, it's ending. Yeah. Uh, the economy is great, no, it's not. This president is wonderful, this guy, he's crazy. Mm -hmm. When are we going to realize what's going on here? Right. Because they want to keep instilling this anxiety, this anxiety. And until a person has what I call the psychic immunity, and I address this in all the work, um, you're going to be punched off all these walls. Mm -hmm. Your head will literally be beaten off the walls of the universe, and you will then become an infected person by this trauma, and you'll infect others, your children, your neighbors, the guys at work, you know, and they'll infect you. And, and before you know it, this is what we got. We've got Friday the 13th, part 14. Here we go, the craziness, the chaos, you see, and they're loving it. The guys upstairs are just laughing themselves silly over this. Right. How can they wheel out the same game? You think they get tired of playing it. You know, you can only play Monopoly so many times, but these guys never get tired because, a, as, as Sidney Webb said himself, it's an ever endless game of excitement, mm -hmm. the great game. The head Fabians have said it, it's titillating. The Colonel Mandel houses are on record telling you it's wonderful. And now they're working on the remote-controlled creature. Because the gun to the head, uh, boot in the face, and eh, they've done that. Mm -hmm. And they can still do it to some you know, rebellious Irish when rogues. When you say you know? remote-controlled uh, creature, are you talking about with the use and interface of technology? Yeah, surely. Yeah, that's surely. What's happening and even more subtle. Yeah. Let's talk about that. You know, for subtle a things. Well, so what are some of the new games? Okay, we've done the boot to the head, as you mm -hmm. say. What are the more subtle games that we can't see? For instance, take the uh, kind of uh, propaganda machinery, right, the media. And the, which is a f form of the war on consciousness, a very important aspect of the war on consciousness. Critical. Yeah, and let's take a, a classic example of how they're showing the cyborg creature, the organic computer, mm -hmm. half man or half woman, cyborg individual. They've been doing this for years, but it's, it's amping up now even in the commercials. Let's take how they're portraying the global village, and you just can't wait for it, you know? Uh, the RFID uh, D chips, uh, the surveillance, uh, you know, to, to keep you safe. Uh, and on the other hand, they're showing you the most frightening, you know, three-headed monsters rattling the gates of your security mm -hmm. to get you right. warmed up for this. Right. Or they may even uh, present, like for instance, uh, one thing I notice a lot is the, is the way that the male is presented in not only commercials, the father figure, the male. Right. This is a constantly manipulable image, as they all are, the portrayal of children, the portrayal of women. But just study one thing, the portrayal of the male archetype. First, they're over-exaggerating it with the Rambo, Arnold Schwarzenegger, mm -hmm. you know, rawhide, a tough guy, you know, over sort of inflated Conan the Barbarian type, you know. Is that because they want you to have one sort of tweaked, skewed understanding of it because they're ready with a second one? The impotent, dweeby, dorky. Mm -hmm. Powerless. Powerless individual. Yeah. They're going to, you know, watch what one hand is doing, as Archibald Wavell, the general, said, because they got something with the other hand coming in. So you, while you're looking over here and thinking, oh, that's a nice archetype, I can identify with that. You know, it's Clint, he's great. Mm -hmm. Bring out the magnum, blow them all away. Yeah, but what's happening is who's coming in over here with another one? So this is going on and on and on. That's Doesn't one that form of control. Doesn't keep you in a state of total confusion as to your own personal identity? This is what well. it's about. Fragment your own identity. Yeah. Mess up the uh, stereotypes and the archetypes so nobody knows if they're coming or going. We don't mind a little movement in that area. Mm -hmm. But to completely subvert things you see in the way that they're doing dramatically is obviously off the wall. It's very dangerous. That's used through technology. Mm -hmm. And then we have the more obvious ones, which other people have dealt with excellently, about the, you know, the actual surveillance systems and right. the, the FIRD chips and all of the scanning things that are going on, and the police amping up all of that kind of thing, and satellites and all the rest of it. You know, I don't get into too much of the individual stuff there. I'm, again, looking at it in broad pictures, mm -hmm. because I guess nobody can understand any of the work that I do without understanding that it's about examining the war on consciousness. Every other idiom that you see, every other permutation that this great war takes is to me satellite. It is a symptom of a more subtle war on the psyche, on consciousness. Because if they can go to the root as they are, and if they can manipulate and, and monopolize the trauma, the original trauma that started in ancient times, then you've got something. Then you have the puppet, the potential, you know, and all the way up to the smiling depressive of a global utopia, which is what's happening now. They're selling you that through Microsoft. They're selling you through a lot of these Fabian left-wing groups that are promising you such wonders and global diversity and harmony. They're selling it at your pharmacy. That's right. All over. All the symbolism, and people are buying into it and all of this kind of thing. 
and we're still seeing the same solar cult symbolism that Akhenaten was using, you know, how many years ago? Thousands of years ago, 1400 BC. Nothing has changed, as I said, when you're dealing with the architecture, nothing's changed. When you're dealing with the architects, well, that's just replaceable test tubes in the experiment. But the building is still there, the laboratory is one and the same. It's still got Akhenaten's picture over the door, you know, it's still, it's still the same temple. Let's talk about Akhenaten. Yeah. What happened there? Okay, let's take that. Uh, if you go back and you keep tracing the symbolism that we're using in the modern age, and you start going through all the things that we've been talking about, about understanding who it is to blame, don't blame the purists, blame the corruptors, and you, and you really, really stick with that truth, then an interesting map opens up. And it helps because you start finding out that there were these east to west connections. Remember when we talked about that? Exacerbated by the fact that it was made easy because there was land bridges. That's not Michael Tassarin saying that, that's Ulf Erlingsson saying mm -hmm. that. You can't get further up the geological totem pole than these right. guys. They've been getting photographs of the Sri Lanka one from India to Sri Lanka from satellite. Mm -hmm. Face it, they existed. Right. They existed between uh, Scandinavia and England and between Ireland and England. Those countries did not look like they did you know, in ancient times. In fact, none of the globe looked like it did, not right. even recent at times. There's recently in Ireland now they found sunken you know, coastlines. Just now, just within the last six or nine months, they found sunken coastlines that defy explanation, mm -hmm. that they look like they went down in a catastrophe. Right. So this east to west movement is fundamental to understanding what happened in Egypt. Because once you understand that the elements of civilization did originate from the west and moved east and south because of the age of cataclysm, and because of these land bridges, slowly into your vision comes the idea that, wait a minute then, these places that look very remote today, for instance, Scotland, the Hebrides, you know what I mean, and Egypt uh, or, or anywhere, Greece, uh, Crete, may not have been as isolated as they appear now. Right. What happens if the Mediterranean was not as big as it was today, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you, you go down that road, you start to see, just take on the board that the map didn't look like what it did today. The Hungary didn't have those borders. France didn't have those borders. These are all modern constructions. And unfortunately, people who have been educated within the last 20 years, they look at that and they think that's been there for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. They have no idea that the world looked totally different. They got to get their heads around that alone. Africa used to have tropical, you know, rainforests. Right. You know, I mean, crocodiles. Me, Egypt, absolutely. You know, and that, yeah. you know, all over the Libyan desert. Mm -hmm. Turkey is still considered geologically a Western culture, a Western in all its bio botany and its, you know, archaeology. And racially, the, the races that lived there were basically Caucasian races, you see. Okay, but let's go continue with the, the thread of this Akhenaten. First step is to realize that Egypt had connections with the West. So when individuals are finding cocaine, in the tombs of mummies, when they're finding images of elephants in, in South America and parrot, feather, uh, parrot feathers in Egypt again, all of this you know, tobacco that they're finding. Why is it so difficult to realize that there was these connections? So let's just add to the mix mm -hmm. the possibility that it was easy to move people and things around mm -hmm. by air in addition to a donkey mm -hmm. and a cart mm -hmm. with land bridges. No doubt about it. I, I have no personal problem taking that on. There's so many anecdotes even yeah. coming out of the, of the, Mahabha, uh, out of the Vedic yeah. uh, traditions that there was aerial you know, Absolutely, Vimana and, the all Vimana that. and all that. Well, but let's, let's say let's for a moment. Say, however, they, they could move. There okay, movement. but even if we don't, you say, okay. say it just was done on horseback or boat. Okay. Why is it still so difficult to realize, you know, with the land bridges, that it was even walkable? The ancient legends say it was, and as I said, that's usually good enough for me. I let science do the catch up. Right. And they're doing it. Right. You know, Professor Erlingson's book is called Atlantis in Ireland. Mm -hmm. You know, or it's also called Atlantis from a geo, uh, geographical perspective or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, Okay, once you take on board those two facts, just those two facts, that the land bridges existed and that the elements moved from the west to the east, you have now revised history, whether you know it or not. So, and now yes, you're, you, you have. You, you, you've just turned a lot of things upside down. You made possible what didn't look possible right. prior. And again, yeah. you're talking about the Diluvian Age. Mm -hmm. So you're saying yeah. there was a an already existing, very refined, high culture mm -hmm. as exemplified through a lot of the Druidic practices, yeah. for example. And again, Druid means el uh, wise ones, it means, right? uh, it means keeper of truth. Keeper of truth. Yeah. So you had a very high culture. From what I'm understanding, you're saying that culture had migrated into Egypt, in fact, at one yes, point. Yes, because of the cataclysm. Because of the cataclysm. So see how the Atlantis book yes. connects with the Irish origins? They're Absolutely. Even different titles, they're basically one continuous study. Yes. Uh, I would only say that the Irish origins jump starts what died with Commons Beaumont 
when Cummins Beaumont was doing the, the west to east thing, yes. it lapsed after his time. I'm the first person to j kick start Pick it. it back up again, I'm not yeah. the expert, I'm not the, but I'm hoping that we can kick start the, the subject so people can go on. And by the way, the people are contributing to my websites. It is happening. We're getting incredible support here uh, and more anecdotes coming around from all around the world in this. Next month, we'll post part two of our conversation with Michael, in which he tells why he feels the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten and his followers exported what we now know as the world's architects of control. Meanwhile, you can pick up a copy of Irish Origins by going to Michael's website at www.terroscopes.com. Until next time, thanks for watching CMN.